and told his father and mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnat of the daughters of the Plishtim. Now take her for me as a wife. His father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brothers and in all my people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Plishtim? This is our leader, right? This is possibly the most famous of the Shoftim. Right? If I had to ask you, is there a Shofit more famous than Shimshon? Probably not. He's probably the most famous. He's certainly the one we know the most about. In the book, he gets, if you count the chapter that describes his birth, he gets four chapters. 13, 14, 15, 16 are all Shimshon. And when you consider that, as we'll see, the first couple of chapters of the book are just prehistory, your Shoftim description really only begins in chapter 3 and ends in chapter 16. So you realize he takes up one third of it. And this is, this is your Shimsha. If you take a look at source number two, the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah quotes you a Pasuk from Shmuel. I'm going to skip the, the part that's anchored in the text and just explain. The Gemara tells you that there are three global lightweights, Kale Olam, and three global heavyweights. And in your generation, you take who you have, even if they are the global lightweights. And the lightweights who are listed are Yubal, also known as the Shofet Gid'on, Bidan, also known as, who? Who is Bidan? <coughs> Shimshon, right, from the tribe of Dan, and Yiftach, who's another one of the, uh, of the Shoftim. They are described as the lightweights. Now, I have to keep in mind, and it's very important to keep in mind when you read this, Tanakh very often has a reason for presenting things the way that it does, and it should not always be taken at face value. So, for example, even though it looks a whole lot like Shimshon marries a plishti woman, Rambam Ralbag, the hard-nosed rationalists, insists that she did convert to Judaism. It's not as though he's going off and marrying a, uh, a, a pure Philistine woman. They're not so impressed with the conversion. And when you read the story, you understand why. Um, but I should make sure to note that. And a lot of work has been done to, to discuss whether the Shoftim who are described here, these judges, are really as bad as they seem upon reading the text. I wanted to make sure to note that right, right up front. Having said that, take a look at source number three. Rabbi Yosef Gabriel Bechhofer wrote a book called Big Day Sheish. Much of Big Day Sheish is sort of a mystical read of what's going on in Shoftim, and he contributes towards this view that it's not really as bad as it looks in the text. And yet, if you look at his, this line from his introduction, I just love this line. He says, Ein lecha sefer Tanakh. No book in Tanakh expresses failure like the book of Shoftim. And that's really what it is. It is a book of failure after failure. And that's what I want to talk about. What are we supposed to learn from a book in which things just go wrong? And when you think they can't get worse, they do. So let's go back first to talk about the outline of the book. We already said, we saw that in the last half hour, that the Jews enter Israel under Yehoshua. He dies 28 years later. Shoftim picks up with Yehoshua's death briefly reviews the events of his reign and then describes the next approximately 400 years of Jewish history in Israel. Not quite 400 years. If you're looking at chronologies and trying to figure out what this is, if you work with the Midrashic chronology in Seder Olam, you're going from about the 13th century before the Common Era until the 9th century before the Common Era. If you work with the secular historical chronology, move those numbers about 165 years back. In, uh, in time. It's the beginning of the Second Iron Age. Um, you do have, if you haven't seen them yet, we have bookmarks from the Herzog Institute in Israel, which actually give you timeline of the books of Tanakh. Very handy. You should make sure to take one at some point. So the themes of the book. Well, first of all, you have to take the book as a warning for future generations. As Ral Bag says in source number four, Ral Bag, Rabbi Levi ben Gershom, wrote a remarkable commentary to Tanakh. One of the best things about his commentary is that at the end of each section, he gives you practical lessons. He's roughly 13th, 14th century. He gives you practical lessons you can learn from that section within Tanakh. So my favorite lesson of Ralbag, one of the stories in Shoftim involves a, a man by the name of Abimelech who is raiding a city and he's standing outside the wall. And, uh, and he gets killed because a woman in the city drops a millstone on his head. And that's how he gets killed. And while Bag, very taciturn, writes as one of his lessons from the story, when you're besieging a city, don't stand right outside the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's an important practical lesson, you know. <laughs> you, need to, you need to know these things. 
Um, but here he writes the following. In source number four, he says, The first lesson includes this entire book's narrative. It is that one who serves God will be watched over and aided by him, and one who strays from him will also have God's supervision stray from him. He will be prepared for all ill. Therefore, you will find that as soon as Israel strayed from after God, they fell into the hands of their enemies, and when they returned to him, they were rescued. That's the most basic version of what's going on in Shoftim is, do good, God will be with you. Do bad, God will abandon you. That's a simple read. There's also a lesson, though, that's much deeper within the book that I find to be very important, and it's what I note for you in source number five. A lesson in the limited utility of miracles and supermen. There's always this sense of, if only God would perform a miracle, I would be perfect. That would be it. And then you read the story of Gidon in chapters six to eight, and you find out it's not true. Because Gidon gets three separate miracles from God, and it doesn't stop him from, in the end, uh, becoming very brutal to his own people, number one. And number two, setting up what becomes, after his time, an idol that the Jews actually follow. He has three separate miracles from God, and it doesn't save him from disaster. And you think, well, if we only had a super leader, somebody who would be empowered by God with miracles and wondrous strength, wouldn't it be great? We'd be wonderful. And of course, that's Shimshon, and that doesn't exactly pan out either. Miracles and supermen are not going to be the salvation of the Jewish people. But the major theme here is that God is moving our national history. Each event begins in Shoftim with the Jews doing what is bad in God's eyes and being, quote, sold to their neighbors. I gave you the reference. If you take a look at source number six, the page number there is page 589. If you have the, uh, the stone Tanakh, it's just one example of how the book tells you this. In the beginning of a story, it says, The children of Israel did what was evil in the eyes of Hashem. They forgot Hashem, their God, worshipped the Baalim and the Asherah trees. The wrath of Hashem flared against Israel. He delivered them into the hand of Kushan Rishatayim. King of Aram Naharayim, the children of Israel served Kushan Rishatayim for eight years. They cried out to Hashem. Hashem set up a savior and he saved them. And that's what Neil ben Knaz, the first of the Shoftim. By the way, interesting note, they translated the word Vayim Kareim in Hebrew as God delivered them. But Vayim Kareim literally means sold. sold them. There's a Pasuk in Yeshaya in which Hashem says, I sold you and they didn't pay for it. Whenever I read Vayim Kareim in Shoftim, I was puzzled. What do you mean God sold us? What did the nations pay? The answer is they were supposed to pay with loyalty to God. And in Yeshaya, God complains. He says, you know, they never paid up. They didn't pay what they were, what they were supposed to pay. But the, each story begins in this way, and salvation is sent by God's appointed emissary, as that passage there in chapter 3 follows through. But here's something that I found, but the first time I realized this, it really hit me, and, and, and I, I like the idea a lot. Um, Shoftim is really an anti-Esther. How many times does God's name show up in the book of Esther? Zero. What's the explanation given for everything that happens in the book of Esther? No, no, the explanation in the book. Oh. Right? Ahasuerus was angry because Vashti wouldn't listen to him. Therefore, he executed her. Therefore, he needed somebody new. Right? Esther is selected because she's you know, more beloved to him than of all the women in, the, uh, in, in this uh, contest that he, that he holds. He wants to have Mordechai paraded through the city because Mordechai saved him from Bigtan and Teresh. Bigtan and Teresh being bad guys who tried to poison him. There's a natural explanation presented for every event in the book of Esther. It never says God did it. Shoftim is the exact opposite. Everything that happens in Shoftim is God was angry and therefore he did this. God was happy and therefore he did that. Only one exception, and that's with Ammon. When Ammon wants to fight against the Jews, and they say, we're angry because you took our land 300 years ago. That, that's the one point where somebody explains what they're doing. But, you know, there are raiders who come into the land from the east, right? Midian comes and raids the land from the east. I don't know what Midian thought they were doing. Did they do it because they saw the Jews had come into the land and were successful raiding from the east, and so they said, we're going to do it too? Was there a famine in Midian such that they needed to go somewhere to get resources? What was it that drove Midian to enter the land? I don't know. All I know in the book is it says the Jews sinned and Hashem brought Midian in. I don't think Midian had a Navi 
who told them God wants you to go invade the land. But that's what Shoftim is doing. Shoftim is telling us everything from Hashem's perspective, not from the natural perspective. It's the opposite of what Esther is doing. And in this book, we find major challenges for the Jews. The challenge of religious consistency. You see idolatry at the end of Gidon's period. You see Shimshon's saga that we already referred to. The challenge of national unity. Devorah goes to war against Canaan. And afterwards, she presents this poem describing her experiences, and she complains about the Shvatim, the tribes, who did not come to help. The challenge of basic righteousness. There's going to be a fellow named Avimelech, who is going to murder 69 out of his 70 half-brothers, and then become a Shofet. The Jews are going to turn to him to lead them. The, uh, the, the challenge of imposing our identity on the land when there are other inhabitants. You have a tremendous problem of syncretism, of the Jews blending worship of Hashem with the practices of the nations around them, so that you find the story towards the end of the idol of Micha, in which they're going to be worshiping Hashem and incorporating a statue at the same time, and thinking nothing is strange. All of this happens within this book. So a little bit of background on the book. Who wrote it? So it's a, it's a recounting of the history, as I already told you, right? Going back to, to the end of Yoshua's day. It is credited by the Gemara to Shmuel. If you look at source number seven, Shmuel wrote his own book, wrote Shoftim, and wrote Ruth as well. But of course, he's writing it at the end, centuries after the events that occurred at the, at the beginning. But that's okay, because Shmuel's job description says Navi, prophet. So therefore, he's good. <laughs> the, um, the, the intent of the book is to teach us these key lessons. So, the, uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about the events of the book. I gave you here an outline after source number seven just to show you the outline of the book. Chapters one and two, introduction, reviewing our settlement in the land, and it actually moves ahead about 150 years into the period of the Shoftim before then going back to the beginning in chapters three to five, and it gives us the first Shoftim through Devorah. This is a period when we become powerful in the land, but we fail in our mission. The Jews of this time are not conquering the land they're supposed to conquer. They're not dissolving the idolatrous society that they have found within the, uh, within the land. And the result is a descent into lawlessness. The next Shoftim are Gidon and then Avimelech. And you find people who outright refuse to follow the show faith. They say, we're not following you, we're not supporting you, we're not interested. And then in Avimelech's time, Avimelech being the murderous one, the, uh, it's complete lawlessness. Then you get the mini Shoftim. You find Shoftim, we don't find out anything about their stories, but we find out that they had 30 children or 60 children. And that they had a whole bunch of cities. And you see here a very interesting phenomenon. They're trying networking. What they try to do is to set up all of these children they sire as the next leaders in the land. And it could be a response to a problem. This isn't my own idea. I saw it elsewhere. I'm blanking now on the name of the person uh, in, in whose article I saw it. I apologize. But he pointed out it didn't work having a single show faith, a single judge. So they say, let's create a network of judges. And this will happen from their children. That falls apart also. That also doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Then you get Shimshon, who is the last question mark Shofet. I say question mark because he's the last one in our book of Shoftim. However, you could argue that in the beginning of the book of Shmuel, Eli the Kohen Gadol, and then Shmuel, you could argue are also Shoftim. Part of the problem is I haven't defined the word Shofet yet. Did anyone notice that? They, um, I'm going to get there. I'm going to try to define the word Shofet. But the last two stories in the book, the idol of Micha and the concubine of Giva, Pilegesh Begiva, these are the worst of things. They're absolute worst of our, uh, of our descent. They don't happen at the end of the book. Almost every commentator is in agreement that these events happened earlier in the story. Only a Barbanel and Radak suggest it actually happened at the end or could have happened at the end. But there are so many elements of the story that indicate that it happened earlier on. For starters, the fact that the story of the concubine at Giva involves the Dun moving north and east to conquer land, which you really only see in the beginning of this historical period. But there are many, many more reasons that are beyond the scope of the discussion right now that show those stories are in the beginning. Why are they moved to the end? In part because they show the complete degradation the nation has sunk to. In, P in Pesel Micha, the idol of Micha, we find Jews 
worshipping in some kind of pagan system, and the tribe of Dun raiding in a, a house of idolatry to take the priest who works there because they want him to go work for them. And they become very Canaanite in their way. They attack an area out of greed to take extra land that wasn't even part of their initial tribal land. And the concubine at Giva, you get, first of all, the murder of the concubine, but then after that, you have a civil war that almost leads to the destruction of the tribe of Binyamin. Complete and total failure. At the, by the time we're done, we're pleading for King David to come along. Somebody, someone's got to save us from this. I gave you a list in source number eight of each of the shoftim. It goes on to the second side. You'll notice that I associate each one with a shevet, with a tribe. That's a Barbanel's work, because the Gemara in Sukkah, which I noted there, says that every tribe had at least one judge, had at least one shofet. So he tries to show which tribe they were from. Some of them require a bit of deduction. But now let's talk about these leaders. Now that we've introduced the book, what kind of leaders are these shoftim? What is a shofet? So the Rambam tells us, if you take a look at source number nine, that the Shoftim had Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration. It's the lowest level of prophecy. He goes through a discussion of, of Ruach HaKodesh, or divine inspiration, and he concludes by saying, this was the level of all of the Jewish judges, regarding whom the Torah said in general that God established judges for them, and God was with the judge, and he rescued them. Judge is the most literal English translation of the word shofet. That's why I used it in this, uh, in this passage. But they are people who have divine inspiration, and they're supposed to, it seems, function as judges. But you look at what they do. In chapter 8, Gidon goes to war against Jewish towns that don't help him in battle, and he makes this a foed vest that becomes an object of idolatry. In chapter 9, as I mentioned earlier, Avimelech murders 69 of his 70 half-brothers, and he goes to war against Jewish cities. In chapter 11, Yiftach makes what the commentators universally read as a foolish vow, leading to something terrible happening to his daughter. What exactly is subject to debate, whether she died or whether she had to go off and live on her own in, uh, in the wilderness? They, uh, and we saw Shimshon above. What, what are these people? How can you call them the leaders of the, uh, of the Jewish people? So there are two schools of thought. First school of thought is a barbanel. A barbanel, I, I laid it out for you in number 10 in an outline. A barbanel says, a shofet is righteous. That's first of all. He says, all the bad behavior of a shofet can be explained. I can explain. So for example, Avimelech, yes, he murdered 69 of his half-brothers. However, that was before he became a shofet. <laughs> you know, power changes you. The, um, Shimshon, his wives converted. Granted, it was a poor conversion, but nonetheless, they did convert. And he goes on in that vein, trying to show that Shimshon's actions were really dictated by God because this was what God wanted him to do. In the end, he says, they are all, on some level, righteous in doing the work of God, and they are like kings. So if you take a look at number 10, he believes that they are all named by Hashem, named by God. It isn't that they're self-appointed, but a Baitin actually appoints them on behalf of the nation. They lead the Jews in war as needed. They have the power to punish and to carry out extrajudicial punishment. You rebel against a judge that carries a death penalty. And there's continuity. There are no periods without judges. That's why a Barbanel needs to put the story of, uh, of the idol of Micha and Pilagish Begiba at the end, because that story says there was no king in Israel. And he says that it's all contiguous. There are always kings in Israel. So he explains those stories took place when Shimshon was held captive among the Philistines, among the Plishtim, and that's why there's no king in Israel at that point. He says there are five differences from kings. They're not anointed. They preside over the courts, and kings are not allowed to preside as judges. The mitzvot of kings don't apply to them, the limits on how many wives they can marry, how much money they can have, and so on. The nation's obligation to revere the king don't apply to the judge, and it's not hereditary. But that's his view of this. A Barbanel has a very pure view of a shofet. Shofet is righteous. However, I understand why they did what they did. The shofet is righteous. He's a servant of God. He's like a king. 
He has an element, as you saw in the Rambam of Ruach HaKodesh, of divine inspiration. That's the way that he looks at it. And then there is the other view. And the other view is held by various commentators. Even if you, if you take a look at Targum Yonatan in source number 11, the Aramaic commentary to Tanakh, which the Gemara says is considered to have been written with divine inspiration. This is a very important commentary on just the beginning of Shoftim, when it says that Hashem appointed Shoftim, notice the word he uses in source number 11. Vakem Hashem Nigidin. God established Nigidin. Nigidin are not judges. Nigidin are leaders. The role of a Shofet, as far as Targum Yonatan is concerned, is not a judge. He's not sitting in court. He's not hearing cases. Maybe some of them did. However, that's not inherent in the role. What's inherent in the role is simply that they lead the Jews, and according to this school, it's on an ad hoc basis, which is the way it sounds when you read the book. Meaning as you read through Shoftim, it says, and God appointed this one to save the Jews. Then they sinned, then they suffered, then God appointed somebody else to lead the Jews, and so on. It sounds like it is ad hoc, and there's great variety among them. And then Professor Yehuda Elitzur, the Dat Mikra edition of Shoftim, makes a beautiful point, which I've seen elsewhere, but I like the way that he summarizes it. There is a broad variety among these Shoftim, among the judges, and that's exactly the point. Meaning, they're not career politicians. Atniel ben Kenaz, our first one, is a farmer and a soldier. Devorah is a prophet. Yair is a wealthy aristocrat. Yiftach is a gang leader. Shimshon is a guerrilla fighter. He never leads an army. He always does it on his own. The message is that Hashem appoints for each generation a leader who suits the times. And I saw a beautiful analogy. Moshe is compared to the sun. Yoshua is compared to the moon. And the judges are compared to the stars. And they're very like the stars. And now take a look at the message that that gives us in the last source on the sheet, source number 12, from Professor Eli Tzur. He says, the essential message which the book of Shoftim seeks to repeat, slash sharpen, because uh, he says lishanein, and I think that constitutes both, so I translated it both ways, which the book of Shoftim seeks to sharpen for all who enter this world is that there is a director of this building, and nothing happens without God. When Israel are given into the hand of the enemy, it is because they have done that which is evil in God's eyes, and when they are rescued from their raiders and foes, it is because God has tired of the struggles of Israel, for they have cried out to him. The, rescues of, the rescuers of Israel are varied, even though all of them are called Shoftim. The common denominator for all of them is that God established them and his spirit was upon them. In other words, we yes, these are leaders. These are our leaders, and they reflect the range of the Jewish people. Even their weapons, when you read the book, it's remarkable. They all have these bizarre weapons. One of them fights off the enemy with a cattle goad. Another one has a special left-handed dagger that he designed for himself. Another one uses the jawbone of a donkey. They, they're makeshift. Everything that happens there is makeshift. It's keyed to the needs of the moment and of that time, and ultimately it carries the message that the whole book carries, which is that whatever's going to happen, it's ultimately dictated by God anyway. So how does this, to go back to the question I asked at the end of the Hoshua Shir, how does learning Shoftim bring me closer to God? The main message of the book is that God manipulates events to recognize God's hand in the world and in history. And for sure it teaches us what we said in the beginning, that when we sin, we suffer. That's something that, that, that one is supposed to look for in the world. But it's also a very positive point, I think. And I like the idea of finishing a book of Shoftim with a positive point. That's hard. The... Um, but that is that salvation can come from any place. And even if we think that we are unworthy, even if we think that our leaders are unworthy, if Hashem wills it, the rescue is going to come. And it's up to us to, uh, to anticipate it. In another minute, we will start uh, Sefer Shmuel with Adam Friedman. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah.